Avalanches are mesmerizing killers, stunning when observed from afar, yet fatal when caught in their trail. I just thought I would die. Worst thing, of course, was to see the people that were dead and the people who were really bad, broken legs and stuff, yeah. It was horrible. These steamrollers of nature can travel at incredible speeds of up to nearly 300 kilometers per hour, generating pressure waves strong enough to knock a bus off a bridge. With an impact force powerful enough to level forests and deadly enough to take lives. If you're trapped in an avalanche, there's almost certainly nothing that you can do. The power and speed of these mountainside phenomena, coupled with their unpredictability, makes it particularly difficult to safeguard against avalanches. When the avalanche happened, it happened so fast, people could not outrun it. With fascinating expert insights and first-hand accounts from survivors, in this episode, we'll be investigating two disaster avalanches that struck Everest in 2014 and 2015, resulting in a devastating number of casualties. We'll also be taking a look at a series of major avalanche incidents in the Alps. So what exactly are avalanches and what causes them? Snow is an extremely dynamic and complex medium to understand, and the same applies to avalanches. So from a scientific point of view, we can predict a lot, but not everything. And we rely on both historical data and also snowfall records to get an idea on where the danger zones are. And it's all statistical, it's like a weather forecast. You might say there's an 80% chance of rain today. And avalanches are the same. You could say, you know, there's a high risk of an avalanche happening there today, but you can never predict exactly when it's going to happen. The Canadian government page dedicated to mountain safety describes the forecasting of avalanches as being as much an art as it is a science. There, there are two aspects that are going to decide when an avalanche will occur. Um, so there is the strength of the snow and there's the, the gravitational force on it. So when the load on the snow exceeds the strength of the snow, um, then, then it will slide. The difficulty with predicting avalanches is, is that snow is a very variable and dynamic material. The strength of snow can vary enormously and it's very hard to predict how, uh, at what point the snow slope will fail, uh, and that can change a lot over time with, with the weather conditions. So snow accumulating on the ground is, is really just the, the beginning of the story. But although avalanches come in a variety of shapes and sizes and might be tricky to label, they always consist of three key features. The starting zone, the avalanche track, and the runout zone. The starting zone is usually situated at a higher point of a mountain and is the most unstable point of the slope. This is where the avalanche begins. The avalanche, now set in motion, crashes down along a natural path, which is the avalanche track. Finally, the avalanche course ends and it comes to a stop in a pile of snow and dross at the bottom of the slope. This is the runout zone. But what actually triggers an avalanche at the starting zone in the first place? A series of factors, including the terrain, snowpack, and weather conditions, are all key triggers that can kickstart an avalanche event. Avalanches are most prevalent around the Northern Hemisphere in winter months, with the highest risk period usually during snowstorm events. For an avalanche to happen, you need a cake layer effect. A surface bed of snow, a weaker layer that can collapse, and an overlaying snow slab. Most avalanches actually happen in the middle of snowstorms, and it's just fresh snow accumulation. And they don't cause so much trouble, mostly. But then other things that can trigger them are the sun, if the snow starts melting and the, the, you get water, and this can start an avalanche. Or if the snow weakens, so it can happen many weeks after the snow's fallen, if the snow crystals are continuously changing, and if they get weaker, then the avalanche can also happen. And then there are other effects, like there can be earthquakes, they can trigger them sometimes, and then also animals. 
all of these natural variables affect when and how an avalanche will occur. But one of the biggest triggers are actually the ones caused by ourselves. Human activity is responsible for a staggering 90% of avalanche events. If you ride a snow sc scooter or you ski or snowboard, um, you can also unfortunately create an avalanche at the wrong time and then you could be caught in it. And turn on the main part of the face before the slide actually caught up with me. Basically after the slide started to move and propagate it out, um, and I just got swept down into the main gut of that chute. And once I went over the cliffs, I, I was under, you know, definitely under the snow. And, uh, that was when I started to get really scared because I knew how fast uh, slides consolidate and how little chance you have once you're set up. Uh, so that's when I really started to struggle and really, really fought as hard as I could for my life. In North America and Europe, avalanches kill around 150 people each year, a significant increase since the 1950s. This rise in fatalities has been directly linked to an increase in snow sports, snowmobiles, skiers, and hikers. Ah bah c'est sûr que ça, ça marque hein, de toute façon, euh, c'est toujours, euh, toujours euh, euh, traumatisant hein, comme, euh, de savoir qu'il y a des gens qui sont euh, en vacances et qui ne euh, rentreront pas. A 29-year-old snowboarder in the USA was tragically buried and killed when he and his friends inadvertently triggered an avalanche while coming down the slopes of Jackson Hole Mountain Resort in Wyoming. Backcountry skiers and snowboarders are advised to carry avalanche beacons that emit radio waves in case they are buried beneath the snow in order to alert rescuers who can dig them out. But the USA is not the only region to experience avalanches where humans are present. Mount Everest, the highest and most famous mountain on the planet, attracting world-class mountaineers from all across the globe. But on the 18th of April, 2014, the mountain was in the spotlight for a very different and tragic reason. There are a lot of avalanches in the spring, and these are caused by the longer days and the increased heat from the sun. And this melts the snow, so the water then trickles down through the snowpack to the bottom of the snow, and this can lubricate it. So you can get huge avalanches because all of the snow all the way down to the ground can come down. And these are often the most, the most dangerous and the biggest. At around 6.45 a.m., disaster struck. A powerful avalanche descended upon a group of Nepalese mountain guides known as Sherpas, who were in the middle of preparing the route and transporting equipment for seasonal climbers. Sixteen Sherpas were killed by the landslide, making it one of the deadliest single incidents ever recorded in the history of the summit. The avalanche struck at the Kumbu Icefall, a treacherous passage between base camp and camp one, riddled with vast open crevices and gigantic columns of ice known as seracs. The avalanche was caused when one of these titanic seracs dislodged. The dislodged ice block would go on to trigger a powerful avalanche made up of ice, rock, and snow. This snow slide bombarded through the Kumbu Icefall, descended on the Sherpas and buried them entirely. Every time you go through the Kumbu Icefall, you're taking your life in your hands. You can be hit by avalanches, you can fall into crevasses, or you can have blocks of the walls of the crevasses falling off on you. And I think in total, there are hundreds of people who've been killed there. This type of avalanche is known as an ice slide or ice avalanche. Ice slides are particularly deadly due to their unpredictability. They are birthed by erratic fractures, rapidly spreading through gigantic ice blocks. 
minimal exposure or complete avoidance of ice fields is the only real warning forecasters can offer. In the tragic event of Everest, however, there was no chance of a forecast to prevent the incident. All that remained was a community and families left to mourn their dead. The Sherpas are highly skilled and strong climbers indigenous to Nepal, with some of the most skilled amongst them called ice doctors. According to the Himalayan database, an estimated 350 to 450 Sherpas are hired above the base camp during climbing peak season as guides for Western mountaineering tourists to Everest. These guides are charged with the most dangerous and laborious tasks of expeditions. Such tasks include hauling heavy equipment and stock up the slopes, fixing ropes and carving out routes in the ice for their foreign clients, who are usually stationed in the base camp below as these preparations are underway. The Sherpas and the local community know that each time they head up through the glacial crevices of Everest slopes, it could well be their last expedition. But in one of the world's poorest nations, it's a risk that many guides must take in order to provide financially for their families. It is difficult to get exact figures on just how much Mount Everest contributes to Nepal's tourism industry but estimates suggest that the Great Mountain may bring in over $3 million from climbers alone every season. The resulting avalanche tragedy saw Everest shut down for the rest of the season, an economic blow to both the country's tourism industry and communities like the Sherpas, dependent on the mountain for their livelihoods. But given the scale of the disaster, it was the most appropriate and safe response the government could offer. At the time, the avalanche of 2014 was the biggest disaster in the history of Everest, with the highest number of fatalities ever recorded on the mountain. No one could imagine a tragedy of that magnitude happening again anytime soon. In April 2015, the mountain was reopened again for the season. Climbers and adventurers from all across the globe flocked to the legendary heights once more, ready and eager to scale its peaks. Everest was back in business. But almost a year to the day of the 2014 incident, disaster struck the great mountain once again. A regular Saturday afternoon on the 25th of April 2015 in Nepal's bustling capital city of Kathmandu. Suddenly, the earth moved. A quake located 225 kilometers west of Mount Everest and measuring in at 7.9 on the Richter scale tore through the capital, killing nearly 9,000 people. For Nepal, still recovering from the events of the previous year, this was a horrific blow. But up on its highest peaks, more tragedy was to follow. Minutes later on Mount Komori, a 7,000 meter mountain situated just a few kilometers from Everest, a powerful avalanche triggered by the quake roared down and ripped through the middle of the busy Everest base camp, submerging it in snow. I remember just looking up to my left and watching this huge cloud. It, was just, it really was like an explosion. 
uh, very impressive. And then just basically diving almost into the tent under the under the table. I remember telling him, "We'll get down, get down, get down." What? But I just, you know, you just listen, and, and I and I a crowd, and I ducked under the dining table was the dining tent, um, and I closed my eyes. I don't even remember hitting the floor when when this sound was just like. Whoo! wind just coming and then just whoo, just hits it, it just hits it was like something hits you you don't know and and we started rolling tumbling and i remember hearing the sound like thump, 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 things accumulating like falling on top of us and I, that's when i thought i said this is it i'm gonna be buried alive and i panic just pure panic you know not wanting to die when it hit you think this is it you know uh, um, I hope if it's if it ends, I hope it it's painless. I hope it's fast. Mount Everest has a tumultuous origin that can be traced to the Earth's earliest tectonic activities. Millions of years ago, the Himalayan mountains gradually emerged from the crust as Earth's Indian and Eurasian plates collided. And today, Everest towers at 8,848 meters above sea level. But the seismic activity which birthed the Great Mountain continues to have an impact, specifically on avalanche events. Earthquakes can act as triggers for slab-type avalanches on slopes and mountains by inducing ruptures in the weaker layer of snowpacks. These ruptures then spread through the weakened snowpack till the slab of snow above gives way and starts to slide, becoming the starting zone of an avalanche. Some of the biggest earthquake events around the world have been followed by avalanches, including the 7.1 magnitude New Zealand earthquake in 2010, the 7.9 magnitude Peru earthquake in 1970, and the 9.2 magnitude Alaska earthquake in 1964. When an earthquake happens, we get seismic waves generated, and these are waves that make the ground move and actually cause all of the damage that we see to buildings and in photographs and on the news. But because the ground is moving, if the ground is particularly unstable, or if snow on top of the ground is particularly unstable, that movement of the ground, and we're not talking very much, we're talking millimeters, if or smaller amount of movement, that can actually destabilize rock or snow or ground and cause avalanches or landslides. On that fateful day, on the 25th of April, those two plates that birthed Everest collided once again. April is peak season on Mount Everest. Close to a thousand people were on the mountain at the time disaster struck with a majority of that number settled down in the south side base camp, preparing for expeditions in the upcoming weeks. The vast tent city, known as Base Camp, has been described as a temporary home to people from all across the world. There are several hundred people that come together there every year in spring, and they wait for the right conditions, and they prepare for their bit to climb Mount Everest. So it's a big hub of activity. This was a particularly busy month, and there were more people than usual in the camp. Figures show it was an almost record-setting year for Everest in climber numbers, with nearly 400 climbers securing permits for the mountain. Survivors have remarked on the relaxed lunchtime atmosphere at base camp that fateful day, with groups enjoying meals, socializing, and checking the internet. It was an idyllic scene. But that would all tragically change in the blink of an eye. The ground is shaking. The whole ground is shaking. Do you, do you hear that? One of the guys from our team, our four-man four team, one of the guys, he started shouting, get down, get down. And as we look, look behind, there was a big powder dust. Couldn't see at all coming towards us. The shaking stopped. I opened my eyes, and um, everything was, was white. 
there was just a lot of snow and I remember trying to scrape it away so, we, so I could breathe and my hands were covered in, in blood. Then when you hear and there was nothing, no sound at all, just pure stillness. And... We received maybe 73 injured climbers that we safely evacuated back down to Kathmandu. Um, and just as we'd finished, there was another earthquake. Casualties included both local Sherpas and tourists of various nationalities. Among the dead were Sherpa guides, Nepalese, and tourists from America and China. The force of it was incredible. It comes over you lightly, and then you're just totally entombed in rock and snow and everything, like all sorts of propellants coming at you. Um, so like a lot of them hit me in the back and took me over and sort of flipped me like a ragdoll. The devastation was extensive. What had been, only a few hours before, a functioning settlement was turned into a desolate scene of flattened tents and blocks of rock, all scattered around a site entombed in snow. Uh, rocks and the winds had taken them out completely. I mean, I, I can't describe it. Our kit was everywhere. Those who were not at base camp also found themselves trapped by the avalanche. These were the Sherpa guides who had gone ahead to set up the camps and mountaineers stuck on camp one and two above base camp. Although there were no fatalities, the group, made up of approximately 200 individuals, were struck from above with some sustaining injuries. The earthquake, aftershocks and avalanche destroyed the route through the Kumbu icefall the same hazardous region where the powerful avalanche of 2014 had barreled through, killing 16 Sherpas. There was one positive for the climbers on base camp one and two. Due to the multitude of up and back trips required in preparation for an Everest climb, there were enough provisions to see the stranded climbers through several days. But both those at base camp and the climbers camped above were locked in a desperate attempt to treat and care for their wounded comrades. There are really three main causes of fatalities in avalanches. Um, the first would, would be trauma. Um, if you're hit by something that is moving fast and is heavy, um, and you can be very easily swept away by a large avalanche, so you'll also be bashed against rocks, possibly swept over uh, cliffs. If you survive that, as the avalanche stops, there's a considerable danger of being buried in the snow. Um, and then the next cause of death would be suffocation. Snow is a porous material with a lot of air trapped in it, so uh, it's not an immediate suffocation. Statistically, um, if people can be dug out of the snow within about five minutes, they have a very high chance of survival after half an hour, there's quite a low chance of survival. Maybe in places where emergency services would take more than a half an hour to get to you. So in that situation, uh, people are really relying on being rescued by other members of their own party. It's also possible to be partially buried by uh, an avalanche, so you may still be able to breathe, but uh, the avalanche snow, once it's settled, will set very hard. It can be very difficult to dig yourself out of an avalanche. So there would, after that, there'd be a risk of hypothermia. With numerous fatalities and injuries, surviving climbers sent desperate messages for helicopter rescue. According to reports, 22 of the most seriously injured at base camp were flown to Farish village, the closest medical facility. However, bad weather and communications were hindering helicopter rescues. Fortunately, I think nobody died in the higher camps. They all managed to be rescued by helicopter or managed to climb back down. It also proved extremely difficult to evacuate climbers trapped above base camp as the route back through the dangerous Kumbu icefall was severely damaged. However, the sheer scale of the disaster and the casualties needing relief was an enormous task for rescuers. Tightly wrapped sleeping bags containing the bodies of the dead lay scattered across the battered encampment. 
transporting the injured and the deceased off Mount Everest was a monumental endeavor. Due to the large number of casualties, a series of multiple trips were required as only two or three people could be transported at a time. This was an unforeseen mass casualty event that would put a strain on even an urban hospital. In order to effectively treat the large influx of victims, those in the most critical condition were labeled with an E for evacuation sign. The entire rescue helicopter operation and assignment of transportation was a massive and difficult endeavor. Eventually, on the Monday, two days after the avalanche struck, most of the climbers who had been stuck on Camp 1 and 2 above base camp were transported down. There were only three small helicopters making multiple two-minute trips. But, at last, all the survivors were safely brought back down to the eerily silent base camp below. They might have been unsuccessful in fulfilling their ambitions to reach the top of the famous mountain, but, incredibly, they had all come away still alive. Because the avalanche ran straight through base camp, a lot of the infrastructure and logistics of all the crews that were preparing for the mountain Everest pit was destroyed. And of course, there was a lot of human suffering, um, not only in, in the local area where the avalanche happened, but all through Nepal. So the entire infrastructure for the climbing season disappeared. And the government decided to close the mountain that year and no summit bits occurred. For some communities, the threat of avalanches are an ever constant feature in their lives and one they have had to adapt to over generations. This is the case for Alpine inhabitants and communities. Avalanches pose a greater threat to human life and property in the Alps than in any other region in the world. This is due to the high population density of the region, as well as the large number of visitors to the mountains. There's now a lot more development in some of these mountain regions um, because they are very attractive tourist destinations. So tourist industry has, has evolved in the mountains for skiing and mountaineering. Like the Himalayas, the Alps are a major attraction, enticing an estimated tens of millions of tourists to their slopes every year. Emerging roughly 44 million years ago, the Alps are the youngest mountain range in Europe. And covering more than 207,000 square kilometers of the landscape, they are a prominent feature of Western Europe's physiographic regions. Human settlement is not a recent phenomenon on the Alps, with humans living amongst the towering peaks since prehistoric times. And with the presence of human activity, the tragedy of avalanche disasters has followed. On a quatre personnes décédées. Euh, donc il s'agit du, du moniteur et euh, d'une famille, euh, un père avec ses deux fils. In December 1916, at the height of World War I, more than 10,000 troops were killed in a single day avalanche disaster triggered by artillery fire on slopes of unstable snow. The mortality rate from avalanches has remained fairly stable over the last hundred years. But the increase in recreational winter activities led to the avalanche deaths nearly doubling in uncontrolled terrains between the 1960s and 1980s. Between 1950 and 1951, however, 
the Swiss Austrian Alps experienced a series of deadly and devastating avalanche events. The extreme winter, known as the Winter of Terror, saw 650 avalanches strike the region over a three month period. High precipitation and strong winds led to the heavy snowfall piling up on slopes till the weak layers gave way and collapsed. The winter report from the Institute for Snow and Avalanche Research documented and described the events of that terrifying winter. The report describes the rolling and crashing sound of the descending avalanche. It also describes the darkness that covered a village, as well as the destroyed houses and homes, which tragically became graveyards for entire families. Several villages and thousands of acres of forest were obliterated. If you think about an avalanche as it picks up speed, it also creates friction and it generates heat. And with the heat, you can have melting of the ice granules, and they form these icy blocks or these boulders. And that makes it very dangerous because it's not the fluffy white stuff anymore. It's actually hard, big chunks that can really damage structures or hurt people. In Switzerland, 1,000 buildings were destroyed. At the village of Vals in Switzerland, the deadliest single event of the winter killed 19 people. In total, 265 people in Austria and Switzerland lost their lives in the disasters. It was one of the greatest human tragedies the nation had experienced since the World Wars. But there were important lessons around avalanche safeguarding learned from these tragic events. In 1953, major safety measures were implemented in the region. These included the implementation of effective avalanche barriers, as well as the use of hazard maps and the expansion of forecasts by the Institute for Snow and Avalanche Research. These improvements would play a significant role in minimizing the number of fatalities in a similar major avalanche disaster in 1999. In some areas above settlements where you know where the risk is and you know where the exposure is, then uh, structures can be built in the mountains, so fences high in the mountains in, in the initiation zone of avalanches to prevent them from sliding in the first place, or large structures rather like dams that could uh, divert avalanches once they have started. The 1999 Galtour disaster was the worst avalanche to strike the Alps in 30 years. On February the 23rd of that year, a series of massive avalanches hit the Austrian Alpine village of Galtour. In just a couple of minutes, the tiny village was overwhelmed and buried in towering walls of snow. It was terrible. What happened? It was terrible. The first thing was sicherly a bild des Grauens. A bild des Grauens over this mit dem hat eigentlich niemand gerechnet. The ersten Informationen konnten nur ja bei Nacht und Schlechtwetter folgen und da hatte man auf keinen Fall den Überblick über das gesamte Ausmaß. Erst bei Tageslicht am Mittwoch in der Früh hat man das gewaltige Ausmaß, das katastrophale, erstmals richtig gesehen. The avalanches, labeled by some newspapers as the White Deaths, caused severe damage. 31 people were killed, 26 of whom were tourists and five who were locals. Many more were injured. 
it's almost a mountain that came down. It's incredible. One moment you see nothing, you hear nothing, and then you uh, get no, no more air. After the avalanche uh, uh, had gone, it was silent. Uh, well, we saw some, some, some light uh, still shining in daylight. Well, we opened the window. And as we are in the basement, we were safe because the rest of the house, all the, all, all the floors uh, just had uh, vanished. The child is dying. Died. I've seen it. I've seen it. And their daughter was also behind it. Playing. I don't know if we can help her. So help us. So it's a fundamental question. If we can have this uh, masterism um, growing. Ski resorts in the region were shut down. This was a huge blow to the resort industry, costing more than $6.5 million for each day of closure. The avalanche was the biggest human tragedy the Alps had witnessed since the 1951 disaster. But the snow fences and avalanche protections put in place since 1953 helped minimize the number of fatalities. And rescue workers managed to save 26 people in the 24 hours following the disaster. We are here now for already 60 hours and have sleep for four hours. I'm a psychologist and I'm going to Ischgl to Kultur and this is my own dog and um, he has a good uh, taste and perhaps also my dog can help and perhaps he can find somebody there. However, the occurrence of the avalanche itself in the village was a scientific mystery. Galtur was a popular mountain village known as a winter sports destination, and although minor avalanches were a frequent occurrence in the region, they would never usually reach the village. This was due to the fact that Galtur was located in the green zone, designated an avalanche safe zone. And yet, paradoxically, it was this exact area that had experienced the most significant avalanche damage. Nature can do strange things. There are certain areas where we know avalanches occur, but then patterns change, weather patterns change, climate is changing, and therefore our historical records may not be accurate anymore. And our predictions where there are dangerous areas may not be correct either. Scientists got to work investigating the event and pointed to a number of weather phenomena preceding the avalanche. Throughout February 1999, three massive weather fronts had caused the largest deposits of snow ever recorded to amass on the mountain. The strong winds piled up the snow into even deeper drifts. Deep below, the melt crust supported an ever-increasing weight of snow. Finally, the crust collapsed, giving way for the snow mass to come crashing down the mountain. The resulting disaster would impact the region for many years to come and change future understanding of avalanche events. Avalanches are inevitable. There are millions of avalanches that happen every year across the world. Most of them cause no trouble and kill nobody and destroy nothing. But what's dangerous is when people go into places that are threatened by avalanches. In Europe, things are very well organized. Um, areas are being 
divided into green, yellow, and red areas. In the red areas, you're not allowed to build any structures. In the yellow areas, you can build structures, but they need to be reinforced. And in the green areas, you can build anything. And this is instigated by the local government or the national government even. Um, so people need to abide by those rules. The main way to prevent avalanches from causing trouble and just killing people and destroying property is just not to build things in the places that are threatened. The disaster events on the Alps and Mount Everest are tragic reminders of just how devastating and deadly avalanches can be. Yet, as Professor Ian Stewart has noted, we still know less about them than we do the surface of the moon. A process known as artificial triggering have been offering an increasing insight into the workings of avalanches. Artificial triggering is the practice of initiating avalanches through controlled explosions in order to safeguard against possible starting zone and prevent larger scale avalanche events which could pose a danger to the public. Artificial triggering of, of avalanches uh, is generally done using explosives which could be dropped out of a helicopter, they could be simply tossed by hand onto a, a slope by ski patrollers travelling at the top of the slope, or uh, artillery shells could be fired at the slope to trigger the avalanche. Switzerland has been using artificial triggering for many years as a means of mitigating avalanche disasters in its Alps and protecting its communities, transport links and winter sports resorts. So in a ski resort, if there's been a lot of fresh snow or they think the risk has gone up, then they'll go out and they'll blast anywhere that they think an avalanche might occur. So that will either trigger an avalanche, or if it doesn't trigger an avalanche, then they'll think probably the slope is safe. So that often happens early in the morning before they open the lifts. There are numerous methods employed to set off a controlled avalanches event. These include hand and manually charged deliveries, helicopter drop-off of charges, as well as permanently installed triggering devices. Permanently installed devices are increasingly used due to their relative safety. In comparison with manual and helicopter detonations, these devices allow for remote operating and remove the need of a human presence in proximity to the hazards of a detonation zone. An example of these devices is the Gazex, an explosive tube containing an oxygen propane gas mixture that can be remotely triggered to start an avalanche. As well as offering increased safety, the devices have proved efficient. The devices create slab-type avalanches by effectively making fractures in the weaker snowpack layer and thereby creating a starting zone. In Switzerland, there are a few hundred such preventative systems that have been set up. But the choice of triggering method is very much dependent on the specific topographical need of each individual peak, as well as costs. Artificial triggering can improve safety and save lives in many different ways. And the primary thing is that when you're triggering, you keep people out of the way. The other thing is that you, if an avalanche doesn't get triggered, then you can decide the slope is safe and people can go back in. And also it can prevent too much snow building up. So it might be a spot that threatens a town or something, and then if you let all the snow build up, it could be a really big avalanche that would hit it. The control and proximity to avalanches offered by artificial triggering is being harnessed by scientists to enable better understanding of these snow events. Artificial triggering systems, along with technology-driven warning devices and reinforced buildings, may be effective preventative measures for avalanches, but they are not cheap nor always safe. For avalanche-prone regions in low- and middle-income countries such as Nepal and India, 
These measures may not be the most cost-effective nor sustainable options to deal with this natural event. Mountain forests, age-old natural barriers used in alpine regions, are increasingly being offered as cost-effective and efficient protection against avalanches and rockfalls. Now it's recognized that forests can be really important for preventing avalanches from happening. So there's a big effort to reforest a lot of areas of the Alps. And if you plant a forest in an avalanche starting zone, this can stop them happening. If it's lower down the mountain, they can also stop smaller avalanches, but they won't stop a really big one. So the main use of forest is to prevent avalanches from happening rather than to protect from them directly. With treetops equalizing temperature and wind conditions, as well as giving stability on mountainsides, forests could be described as nature's perfect blanket against avalanches. However, natural phenomena such as storms or wildfires can put these forests at risk. Deforestation, climate change and global warming pressures are also impacting on mountain forests and any protection they may offer in future. Some scientists have theorized that warming temperatures and climate changes could also be behind avalanche disasters on Everest, regions which might potentially benefit from the use of mountain forests. But all mountain ranges have diverse topography and not all regions are suited or capable of sustaining forests in a similar way to the Alps. For now, there is no individual solution to combat the unpredictable force of avalanches. And until we can find more cost-effective and accurate methods of tracking their trajectory, they will continue to be one of nature's most unpredictable killers. Deadly Disasters